What are the first steps in the medical management of lower urinary symptoms? Yeah, so behavioral modifications. So um, if you're an executive at a water company and all you do is drink water all the day, all day long, you're going to urinate a lot. So a, a lot of it is just education and behavioral modifications. So educating people that a lot of what you take in will come out. That you know that the idea that you know the kidneys are designed to maintain our body's fluid status in a kind of homeostasis. If you increase your fluid intake, you're going to have increased urinary output. And so just basic educational things about that is really, really helpful. In addition to regulating what you drink, it's when you drink it and what's in what you're drinking. So a lot of people will come in and, and come in with symptoms of nighttime urinary frequency. And a lot of that is just you can modify with education saying, hey, don't, you know, don't drink, you know, two glasses of water right before you go to bed. And if you get up in the middle of the night because you have to urinate, don't drink another glass of water right when you get up to, to urinate. So, so that kind of component of the education timing of when you take in those fluids and then what's in the fluids, specifically caffeine. Mm. Um, and there are some fluids that have natural diuretic properties. And so if you are taking or drinking a, something that's a diuretic, you're going to produce more urine and that will result in more urinary symptoms within two to four hours after taking that fluid in. So caffeine, for example, uh, is a natural diuretic and it will cause you to produce more urine over a certain amount of time than you would have if you didn't, if you took in uh, iced tea with no caffeine in, for, in, it, in it, for example. So a lot of educational things, a lot of, um, a lot of um, education about what to do, when to do it. We often will have people do voiding diaries, um, but really it's a diary of what you're, what you're drinking and then when you're urinating. And actually just having the patients just walk, that, walk through that with them will, will be quite helpful. Right, so they're measuring their input in timing exactly. and, and volume yep. and output in timing and volume. Yeah, and that simple task, which is you know easy, easy to do, will result in A, a realization that, hey, I'm drinking, you know, 130, you know, ounces of water a day, like what, you know, and it's, it's all excessive, it's unnecessary, because you can show them that, yeah, you're urinating out the same basic amount of volume, because we also get in our foods, obviously water too, or, or fluids. So, so mapping out, mapping out kind of behavioral modifications is the first step I always do. If it persists and they're bothered by it, then we'll talk about doing avoiding diary, particularly if their symptoms are a little bit unusual. For example, if you're sensing that they're maybe urinating much more at night than you would anticipate after they've done these different behavioral modifications. There are hormonal, hormonal, um, you know, uh, hormonal uh, deficiencies that can result in increased urinary production at night, for example. So if we're suspicious of any of those things, or if patients are still bothered by their urinary symptoms and they, um, they're, they want to not go on a medication, we'll do avoiding diary, we'll map out when they're drinking, when they're urinating, and then we'll kind of go from there. Now, now what, what if a guy comes to you and, and is sort of upset about the frequency with which he's waking up to pee at night? The medical term for that, of course, is nocturia. Is there a norm, right? So you and I are 50 years old. Um, I would say five nights a week, I don't get up to pee two nights a week, I get up to pee once. Yeah. And obviously that's probably more tied to the timing of my fluid intake and what it was than, you know, necessarily prostate specific symptoms. But what's normal if there's such a thing as normal for a 50 year old, a 60 year old, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Cause there's a lot of variability in terms of what you can expect based on, on the age of the individual. So there are, there's a, there's a naturally secreted hormone, antidiuretic hormone. And it, in younger decades of life, it has a, a surge of release around seven or eight o'clock at night. Antidiuretic hormone prevents you from diuresing or producing more fluid. Alcohol, by the way, inhibits this hormone, which is why alcohol before bed is a great recipe for having to get up and pee for two reasons. You get the fluid yes. in the drink, yes. and then you get a molecule that inhibits the release of antidiuretic yeah, hormone. Absolutely, and, and so the classic one for that is beer because it's a higher volume, high volume, high, high volume yeah. Uh, intake. So yeah, so you, we have natural diurnal release of antidiuretic hormone and that diurnal variation is attenuated kind of per decade as we get older. Mm. So that peak of antidiuretic hormone goes down per decade and that can, 
then kind of normalize your 24-hour urine production, whereas when you're in your 20s or 30s, you would produce, let's just say, 80 or 90% of your urine during waking hours. During the nighttime, when you have high levels of antidiuretic hormone, you're not going to produce as much urine and your kidneys and your body will save that extra fluid for the morning when you get so, up. So is there a biologic explanation for the attenuation of that hormone as we age? You know, it's a good question. I don't know the, I don't know the answer that to, as to why that could be, but certainly we see it in general in aging populations, men and women. I see. So, because I did, I, after we had got through this, I wanted to ask the exact same set of questions yeah. around female symptoms. Yeah. But so right now you're saying there's an equalizer. Both men and women experience this reduction yes. in, uh, in, yeah, in, in, in antidiuretic hormone as we age. And then there are other factors that are also similarly consistent among aging individuals, male or female, like the resiliency of the tight junctions in your capillaries and uh, uh, your vascular system, right? So it's you know, less resilient and less tight as we get older, right? So you have, even if it's subtle and not fully appreciable, you have some capillary leak. And as you lie down when you're sleeping at night, you know, that fluid will leave the extracellular space into the intravascular space and your kidneys will read that yep. as increased fluid. So, you know, I'm a very, I have a very focused urology practice, but when I have people with urinary symptoms, I try to do a, a really full body assessment because one of the main drivers of uh, nighttime urinary frequency, or one of them at, that's particularly tracks with age is, you know, just peripheral edema. So are you, are you developing edema and so forth? So meaning people who have a lot of peripheral edema at the, in nighttime, you get uh, basically reversal of some of the third spacing. Yes. And it's almost like they have an IV drip that's yeah. taking fluid from yeah. the interstitial space into their vascular Completely. space. It's like they're drinking at night. Yeah. So one of my behavioral modifications, it's not really behavioral, but non-medical modifications is, you know, knee high TED stockings for people who are having symptoms who, if I see them at eight or nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, they had any edema, any kind of ringing around their socks or something like that, then I definitely strongly encourage them to, mm, to, to do that because it, it, you know, I tell people if you're getting up twice a night and you have a little bit of edema, you do some behavioral modifications, we can reduce your nocturnal urinary frequency by kind of one. So you can go from two times a night to one time at night, just by changing when you drink and wearing Ted stockings. And that's a, it's a, maybe not true for everybody, but it certainly encourages people to do simple things without doing the polypharmacy. The other thing that um, is a main issue related to nocturnal urinary frequency is sleep apnea. And I'm sure you've talked mm. a lot about sleep apnea on a variety of your different uh, your shows. It is a driver of a lot of just bad pathology. And one of them is nocturnal urinary frequency. And, it, and we'll talk about it later, but in the post-prostatectomy space, it can actually result in profound nighttime urinary incontinence. Mm. But it will produce a uh, really sy symptomatic, profound uh, nocturnal urinary, urine production and nocturnal urinary frequency in individuals. And why is that? It's, I think it's also related to the, the regulation of your antidiuretic diuretic hormones. And um, huh. really there's profound, you know, whole body side effects from it. So, you know, in many ways, if there's a, there's a subset of men who, um, this is a good way to encourage them to get their sleep apnea A diagnosed and then treat it. Okay, so, so that's so that's behavioral. Yeah, that's, so, so then let's talk about the pharmacologic tools. So you've already kind of alluded to one, and it's one that we use in our practice, um, which is when we have a guy who otherwise we don't have a clear explanation for why he's getting up to pee, um, and he doesn't appear to have a particularly enlarged prostate, and we can, we're going to talk about, of course, all those things, a very low dose of desmopressin, which is this, I get, is the synthetic version of the antidiuretic hormone, uh, typically 0.2 2 milligrams before bed, uh, has profound effects. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that and then maybe some of the other things. And, and also, are there any contraindications to the use of that? I know certainly theoretically a contraindication or a concern would be hyponatremia as you would sort of increase uh, plasma volume uh, and therefore dilute sodium, but maybe just talk a little bit about how you would use that. Yeah, so there there are very straightforward, you know, frontline medical management, um, med uh, you know, pharmacologic agents to manage lower urinary tract symptoms. And generally speaking, the 
frontline ways that we manage it would be with an alpha blocker. So there are um, that's a, a, a class of compounds that are nowadays very, very specific to prevent activation of um, a set of smooth muscles that are really isolated mostly in the prostate and somewhat in the seminal vesicles. And so if you just take a step back and look at the embryology of the prostate, it obviously is a, um, it develops from urogenital, the urogenital sinus, and there's mesenchymal and epithelial components of that. So there's a lot of smooth muscle within the prostate. The smooth muscle exists within the prostate in part to help with ejaculation. Mm -hmm. It's a effectively like- It's like a pump. It's a pump. Yeah. So once you have, when you're having an orgasm, the, the pump squeezes, the prostate will squeeze, and that will result in emission of the fluid. So what you can do for individuals who have lower urinary tract symptoms is that while you have this channel, this tube going right to the middle of it, that's the urethra, the urethra. Yep. you can relax the smooth muscle within the prostate and that will relax a little bit and, and theoretically it enhances the diameter of the, of, the, uh, of the prostatic urethral channel. That's the thought for how it works. And that could then result in relaxation and improvement in urinary symptoms. And it works quite well for most people. Now, originally this was noted because of the kind of first class of, of, of alpha blockers were used for blood pressure control. And so one of the side effects of the first generation of these medications was just profound hypotension until you kind of titrated up the dose and so forth. But the more modern, med more modern ones um, really effectively treat specifically the uh, so they're selective in that they relax those muscles without dropping yeah. blood pressure and and the newest generation of ones will actually be more are even selective to the smooth muscle within the prostate and not the seminal vesicles so the seminal vesicles and the prostate kind of grow up right next to each other for example when you do a radical prostatectomy you take out both organs they're attached to each other the mm -hmm. seminal vesicles dump into the prostatic urethra so the second generation, third generation um, anti-muscarinics, or I'm sorry, alpha blockers would paralyze or prevent contraction of the prostatic smooth muscle, right? So you would have improved urinary symptoms, but would also have it doesn't decreased. impede ejaculation. It would. They would impede ejaculate. The the kind of the first more targeted ones would yes, because they, they would in fact paralyze both. Paralyze both. Yep. The newest generation of um, the newest classes of these uh, of these medications really focus only on prostate, and so the impact on volume of emission of seminal emission or or semen is actually much less impacted. And so I usually will just reach for those; they're great. So what are, what? How many of those are there out on the market today? There's there's three. Typically today, you would only use these third generation alpha blockers. What what are, what are they what are they called? What yeah. are the names of so these drugs? So alfuzacin is the uh, one I usually go to, but there's another, uh, you know, third three point five generation medication called sildenafil. Rapaflo is what that's go goes by, and then alfuzacin goes by. Um, uh, I don't know. Alfuzacin and sildenafil are the two newest medications that are third generation that result in less impact on sexual dysfunction, specifically less impact on semen production, but have really, really outstanding uh, uh, efficacy in terms of relaxing the prostate and improving urinary symptoms.